thank you so much for, um, you know, being a part of this today. And, you know, we're in the middle of this, uh, our current sermon series called The Power of Love. And so I just want to, again, thank you for being willing to come today and just share with us the power of God's love made real in your life. And so uh, uh, just uh, I want to pray for us just real short. God, uh, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for Leo, for all that you've done, for all that you're doing and all that you're going to do in his life. Lord, use him today. Uh, just to speak the truth of who you are to us. And uh, Lord, we're not just going to hear it today. We get to see it in Leo's life. So thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Well, Leo, you and I are both Crosby County boys. (laughs) So uh, tell tell us a little bit about your life growing up and your life before Jesus. Okay, Andy, uh, uh, I come from a big family. there was 12 of us with my mom and dad, uh, four sisters and five brothers and myself. Mm. We lived out in the farm and, you know, country kids. It was <laughs> great. But um, my family were good, loving people. My mom was loved the Lord. My dad was a little bit on the hard side. He drank a lot, but he was a hard worker. And I had a lot of brothers and sisters that I could look up to. But um, I tell you what, the first time that I had an encounter with the Lord, and I didn't know it till 25 years later was when I was eight years old, hmm. eight years old. I was taking a nap in my mom and dad's uh, bed. And one day when I woke up, I woke up in the closet and it happened three days in a row. Hmm. And on the third day, whew, I, I saw it there. I was kind of climbing a steep hill and these big old boulders were coming down at me, big white boulders. And I screamed and yelled. My mom came to my rescue. But that was the end of it. Eight years old, forgot all about it. And it was just, I carried on with my life. Hmm. So, um, now, I mean, when I was 16, Hmm. I did uh, have kind of a bad situation with my dad. You know, you can't tell a 16-year-old what to do. (laughs) No, you're a 16-year-old. It's the smartest person on the planet. (laughs) You're right. And nobody's telling him what to do. So uh, I moved off from the farm to Crosbyton with my sister. And she was a God-fearing woman. She loved the Lord. And uh, we went to a revival one day. And uh, there was, I had these big old blisters on my fingers, big blood blisters. I had it stuck in a, in a door, and it was pretty bad. So we went to this re- uh, revival uh my sister asked me, Leo, you want to get up there and go to front and, and you know, get a taste of the Lord? And I was kind of like, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Because I was seeing everybody, like, you know, worshiping and just going to their knees. And, and wow. And I said, okay, well, I guess, why not? So I go up there and I could feel all the, I mean, it's the spirit of God moving around. You know, at 16 years old, I wasn't sure what it was. I know now. But at that time, it was just so romantic. It means just awesome. So I got a little bit of it and I was coming back to the, go sit down with the congregation. And when I sat down, I looked at my fingers cause it was already a, something that I would do. Cause I could feel them. They were gone. Mm. They were just like vanished. They weren't even there. And I'm, I told my sister, Yolanda, sister, sister, look. And she goes, wow. I said, yeah, where'd they go? She goes, that's the spirit of the Lord. That was my, mm another encounter that I had with the Lord at 16. Hmm. And here I go again, you know, being 16, trying to know everything, you know. So as I grew a little older, I turned 18 years old, uh, got out on my own. I didn't graduate from high school. A little bit, I had to go, I moved to Rawls uh, to a house that mom and dad has, uh, a rent house. So as I'm there, at 18 years old, I'm in the living room, just got off of work in the living room, and a car passes by in front of my house, pulls up to the house, and somebody knocks at the door. Oh, boy. Now, I knew who it was. The devil was knocking at the door. Mm. Exactly what happened. So, it's a young lady. I, I answer the door. It's a young lady. And she goes, hey, Leo. And I'm going like, well, wait a minute. Who are you? 
She goes, don't you work for my brother? I'm going like, oh, okay. I said, how can I help you? She goes, can I use your bathroom? And I'm going like, uh, I guess. So she jump, goes in the bathroom. I go in the living room, watch TV, whatever. And and it's, I'm looking at my clock, you know, my watch, and it's taking 15, 20 minutes. And she ain't come out of the bathroom. So I go up there and knock on the door. And I say, hey, you okay in there? Nothing. I don't get a word out of her. So I knock again, nothing. I try to listen, nothing. So I finally go, hey, open the door. She goes, okay, give me a second. So she opens the door, and I find her with a needle in her arm. And I'm going like, what is that? And she told me. She said what it did to her. She goes, do you want to try it? And I'm thinking, no. She goes, come on, it's not that bad. So, 18 years old, not very smart, I do one. And that was the beginning of my life. Going down the drain, had a monkey on my back. Horrible. For eight years, I was a junkie. Living on the street. Didn't have a care in the world. Didn't care about myself. Period. Mm. Uh, I met someone. I got married. Still as a junkie, had two kids. My life just went down the hill. And I told my wife, I said, look, I'm not going to take you down with me. I'm just going to let you go. So we got divorced. My life got even worse. And it was just bad, bad. So I met another young lady. And that's when things got really bad. We started going around doing things, we should, crimes, you know, stealing, just whatever it took to get high and here I go again she leaves I'm by myself and what happens I go to the drug dealer to try to find some more dope and I found what I'm looking for so I take off and I couldn't do nothing with it you know I was intravenously doing it and it wouldn't break down to put it in intravenously so I go back to the drug dealer house and I said, hey, dude, what do you sell me here? He goes, what are you trying to do? And I told him, he goes, no, you don't do that. You smoke it. I'm going like, what? And I got introduced to crack cocaine. And another eight years of hard, hard life. I developed an addiction to crack cocaine for 16 years. I was addicted to cocaine methamphetamines, you name it. I was going way down the wrong road. So far for 16 years till finally the good Lord put his hand in front of me and goes, no more. This is the end of it. You're going to stop. And sure enough, I committed a robbery and it stopped. They locked me up. I get put in, in the Lubbock County Jail. And when I get put up in the Lubbock County Jail, there's a guy across from my cell. He goes, hey, dude. I'm going like, yeah. Uh, we do Bible studies at night. <laughs> you want to do Bible study? I'm going like, you know, I'm an addict for 16 years. Why would I want to do Bible studies? But something was driving inside of me, and I'm going like, okay, sure. Why not? So I stayed in county jail for a year and a half until they, my parents bonded me out. But for them, a uh, year and a half, I did Bible studies every night. Every yeah. night. But something inside of me was pulling me away from the Lord, kept pulling me away. For 16 years of this, it was hard to let go. So hard to let go. I couldn't make it. I couldn't make it. I got back out for a little while. I just couldn't make it. So it was time for me to go to see the judge to get me sentenced. I'm high going to get to see the judge. And at that day when he sentenced me, something drove inside of me. They put me into the county jail. They get all your stuff together. Then they shoot you upstairs. And when they shot me upstairs to get in my own cell, 
The guy opened the door. He said, step in. I stepped in. And when I stepped in, I fell to my knees. And I said, I can't do it no more. Mm. I couldn't do it no more. I was tired and I was tired day after day after day and I couldn't stop. I just couldn't. The good Lord I was on my knees, giving my life to him. He overshadowed me, took this person that I was, the addict that I was, and just removed it. No longer was I who was I used to be for years and years. I was a totally different person. That's and like I'm they write Second Corinthians five seventeen. If any man is in Christ, new he Christ. is a new new creation. The old and, and the new is think of an eye just like that. Yeah, and and I couldn't believe it. I'm going like, you know, I'm sixteen years, and all of a sudden, it's just I'm not who I used to be. And I'm singing worship songs that were inside of me. I don't even know where they came from. Mm. I was talking to the other J, uh, inmates about the Lord, and things just fire just went on. Mm. And I was there for about a month and a half, and they sent me to the big house to go do my time. I was sentenced to 15 years. Mm. And, I mean, it was just, once I got in there, it was, whew, I never been in a place like that. Mm. And to carry a Bible in your arms, everybody's just looking at you. So one day, and I'll tell you a little story. One day, I was in cell blocks, about 50 of us. And I'm sitting there on my bunk reading my Bible. And a young man comes up, going to bunk right next to me. And he's got these bags and bags of food. And we started talking, and, you know, we're talking, and I'll tell him about the Lord and the Bible, why, you know, why I read it, how I love the Lord. And I kind of give him a testimony of what I've been through. Well, here comes these other four guys that are all muscled up and, you know, going to go, like, they're going to run something. I'm, I'm kind of looking at them, going like, okay. So they walk up there where we're at, and they're talking in Spanish. They're talking about they're going to take this. They're go that belongs to them. They want them cookies. They're going to get the soups. Everything they're just going to take. Mm. Well, <laughs> mm. I didn't know you're not supposed to get anybody's business. <laughs> but I did. And I told him. One of the guys looked like he was the leader. because He was older than the rest of them. And I said, look out, guy. Uh, you can't just take those because those don't belong to you. They belong to this guy. And the guy over there goes, no, it's okay, it's okay. I said, no. Hmm. I said, they don't belong to them. They belong to you. And somebody's watching, so it's okay. So the guy goes, I see you carrying a Bible there. I'm going, yes, I do. I love my Lord with all my heart. He goes, okay, we'll be back. And I'm going, okay. <laughs> so the guy, the guy that all this stuff belongs to, he goes, man, you're in trouble. They're going to beat you up. Everything It's going to be bad. I said, okay, well, let's we'll see what happens. Well, they're in the corner of the place there in the cell block, and they call me over there. And the guy that was sitting beside me goes, you're in trouble now, dude. They're going to beat you up. So I pick up my sword, my Bible, and I walk over there. And they come around me real fast. I mean, one on each side. And they're going like this. Yeah, that's it for you, talking in Spanish. You know, how they're going to beat me up. But the leader walks in. He said, so I see you carrying that Bible. Are you doing this for real or are you just trying to get protection? I mm. said, oh, I said, I love the Lord and I'm going to, that's what I do. I take care of myself, I take care of my people and I love the Lord. And he goes, well, let me tell you something. I'm not scared of nobody except, and he points up, <laughs> yeah. he said, but I am scared of him. And you know what? Today is your lucky day. I'm going to let you make it. You mm. get back over there and take care of your business. All right. So, you know, and now kind of my flesh come to alive and go like, oh, my shoot, what am I doing? You know, I didn't realize what was going on. <laughs> so as I was walking away, he goes, hey, I said, I turn around and go, yeah, he goes, anything you need, anybody give you any problems, come look me up. <laughs> El Chuco or something. I can't remember what his name was. Something like that in that sort. And from then on, nobody ever touched me. Nobody ever said mm. that to me. I got to bring the word to people. People was always asking me, how come I'm so happy? Mm. How can you be happy being in a place like this? 
I said, if you get filled with the Lord, you're always happy. Things mm. are going to come against you, but it's it's good. Because uh, you you know, it's not where you were on the outside; it's who you were on the inside that was making the difference. Yeah. Big difference, big difference. Mm. So while I was in there, uh, I went from unit to unit. They just transfer. You know, finally I get to a unit where I get to do my two year college degree. But I had to get a GED first because I'm, you know, I didn't have no kind of schooling. Sixteen years on the attic. You don't read a newspaper or read a book or nothing. Watch TV, nothing. So I go in there to schools and the teacher goes, you want to apply for your GED? It's fixed to come up. I'm going like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> he goes, it'll probably be a little hard, but I think you can do it. And I'm going like, okay. So the day came that we get to do our G, uh, take our GED test. So we get in the classroom and the good Lord gives me a signal. I sit there and pray before I take my test. And all I could hear was angel wings to me. Yeah. And, I, and I knew he was there with me. Yeah. I took my test two weeks later, going down the hallway, and here comes the teacher. Perita, hey, you passed. And I'm going like, what? <laughs> yeah, you passed. And at that moment, I knew things were going to get better for me. He even gave me a, a job being assistant teacher. And I didn't know nothing about teaching, but the good Lord being with me, anything's possible. Isn't that what he says? Yes, mm -hmm. all things are possible with him with us. So, and I was there, I decided to take my, uh, get into a soldier's degree. So I got my two years in soldier's degree. How could I, if I didn't, in here was already so poisoned with the addiction and with the drugs, but when he took all that out of me, he gave me everything new. Mm. And here I go, <laughs> going mm. to college while I was inside and graduated. Mm. Lord was good, let me tell you. Mm. And sure enough, things were going better and better. And there were times that they would lock us down. I would bring the word to the rest of the guys that were there that would all come around with me. We would all talk and pray. And when they would close the church, on a Sunday, for some reason, they have enough guards. We'd go to the rec uh, hall there, and we'd bring the word. Always mm -hmm. talking about the Lord. Always talking about the Lord. Always getting people involved. If there was people coming in. We were singing hymns. We were, I mean, it was just, it was awesome. Mm -hmm. Always there. Always. So, so uh, how many years did you serve? Ten years. Ten and a half. Ten years. And then, Leo, I know you did a ton of ministry while you were in prison, but give us at least a glimpse, a little glimpse of how God has worked through you uh, since you've gotten out with you, your family, and, and even uh, through you for the world. When I first got out, there was a church in Crosbyton, that Temple of Mananata, that did a three-day three -day revival. And I was a key speaker. And he let me give my testimony. And mm. everybody that knew me, that knew the kind of person I was, showed up. Mm. Hear what the Lord had to say. A lot of people gave their lives to the Lord those three days. And I gave mm. everything that I knew that had happened. And it took three days. It was long. <laughs> I told every story. But <clears throat> it was awesome. I got to teach a little bit. I even got to bring sermons sometimes for the church. It was really, really good. And then I moved to uh, out of town, went to Midland, Odessa, and uh, it got even better there. Uh, I got involved in the prison ministry. Hmm. That means you get to go back to prison. <laughs> People are going like, you're crazy. What are you going to yeah. go back for? I'm going to go back and serve the Lord. I'm going to go talk to the people that are locked up that don't know the Lord, give them my testimony, give them my story, what God has done for me, he can do for them. And it was just amazing how people would just listen just because they actually talked to somebody that's been there before. Yeah. And that was amazing. Yes. Hmm. Well, tell, tell me, tell me, uh, I know you shared with me before kind of how 
your mom went through a crisis and uh, how oh. you uh, with just came in and the Lord used you to pray for her. Hallelujah. That's right. My mom got, she wasn't feeling very good and they took her to see the doctor and they did a colonoscopy on her and some doctor on the hood was uh, messed her up on the inside. She got poisoned. So her kidneys, her lungs, her heart, her, everything was started shutting down. So they put her on these machines and whatnot and was trying to pull her through and she'd blow up and she'd go down and she, I mean, it was just like really, really bad. And this was before I went to Odessa. This was here in Lubbock, right two years before I graduated from Texas Tech. Oh, oh, wait. Oh, yeah. That was, that was a little thing. You what? I'm sorry. I graduated from Texas Tech. Yes, with okay. uh, Community Family Addictive Services and the Bachelor of Science, Human Science. Wow, wow. 2014, yes. Okay, so 16 years on the street, not didn't have a GED or anything, and uh, but you have your uh, degree uh, from Texas Tech. That's so. That's awesome. Now, and uh, who, who greater, was that? Greater yeah. he that is in me than he that is in the world. Amen. Okay, back to your mom. Okay. 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 And uh, so I was in Crosbyton uh, doing some work on. Uh, can't remember what I was doing, putting a facial board or something. And I get a phone call from my oldest brother because they were down here with my mom and sisters and everybody was in there on my mom's side, by her bedside. And he calls me. He goes, Lee, I don't know what you're doing. He says, drop everything. Get over here because I think we believe she's gone. I said, what do you mean she's mm -hmm. gone? She left? He goes, no, she died. The doctors try to revive her. They've given heart, you know, they're pumping her and, and trying to give them up just wouldn't come back so they got her on the machine her oxygen is down to four percent mm. i was okay. strong you know i was a soldier and it, it didn't affect me like it affects me now but so i took off and i came to lubbock and it was seemed like i was in a in a tunnel there was no cars on the road or at least i couldn't see no cars in the road so I drove all the way to uh, the hospital, and when I get there, half of my brothers and sisters, my nephews, my nieces, everybody's screaming and crying and not knowing what to do. And I walk in the door, and I'm going like, wait, what's going on? And everybody's saying, she's gone. She died. She's gone. It's okay. And when you walk with the Lord... Never expect anything but good to come to you. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing but good. Always. You're going to overcome because he's there with you. So I walk in the door and I'm sitting there looking at everybody and trying to calm everybody down. And I walk up to her. And I grab her hand. And I look up. And I raise my hand. And I said, Lord... I'm not trying to be selfish. I know she belongs to you. We all love her and you know that. And I said, Lord, give her one chance to be with us a little longer. We just need her in our lives a little longer. And the RN comes walking in. Run my friend, he was running in. He ran, he goes, I don't know what y'all doing, but keep doing it because she's coming back. <laughs> and it was like, Thank you, Lord. Mm. It was awesome. My sister, mm. I had a sister goes in there and she starts singing hymns and everybody just started singing. And sure enough, her oxygen level picks back up. The machine just get going. I mean, it's just like, <laughs> that's when we knew God was alive. That's for real. I mean, yeah. you and, and, your, and, your mom, and your mom got well and got out of mom there. Mom got well and she got out. And she knew nothing about what happened, what she went through, and we had to tell her. She was amazed. Mm. And she was going, like, wow, that's why I raised you always loving God. you got to listen, and he'll listen mm. to you. Yes. Well, I, uh, you, you, you go back again to your eight-year-old vision and, and explain what, okay. how you understand that vision today. It was at... 33 when he when the good lord told me 
remember what I brought you when you were eight. At 33, when I was stopped by him and them white substance, the rocks that were falling on top of my head were going to be the crack cocaine, the cocaine, the methamphetamine. The drug yeah. addiction was the, yeah. what was going to railroad me and put me down. And yeah. was going to be there to lift me up out of it. Yeah. It took 25 years for me to understand and look back and God reminded me and allowed me to see that hmm. what I dreamed at eight years old. Wow. Oh, uh, well, Leo, thank you for sharing. Uh, and I know there's a whole lot more to the story, oh. uh, but I just, I, just kind of curious, you know, what's next? Uh, what, what do you feel God calling you to do right now in your life? I've been wanting to go to school to be a lay person or someone that can bring the word mm. in front of the congregation, mm. not just my story, to bring his word mm. to the people. That's what I want to do. If right now I'm working and it's just hard to make time for little times that I do have. And I just, especially going back into the prisons, that is where it's real beneficial. Yeah, those we need to. They come out. Those people that come out have no idea. Yeah. They have to know that there is somebody that's been through that and has yeah. made it. And that really, in this COVID season, I mean, prison ministry has almost just gone away. So we need to we need to pray for that. When it so, fires back up, guaranteed, yeah. I'm going to be putting in trying to get yeah. back. What what, uh, Leo? Uh, Tell us a little bit just about, you know, uh, your involvement at St. Luke's and how that happened and, you know, uh, what, what, you know, kind of how you're connected right now in our Christ-centered family. Well, uh, when I moved here back to Lubbock, uh, God-fearing man, I knew I had to find me a church. And I was uh, a big part of the church in Midland, Odessa, uh, Methodist Church. Okay. And uh, I'm talking about board of trustees. I was everything, yeah. re teaching kids. And uh, I got here and I went to the Methodist downtown. And there was a lady there and she asked me what I was looking for or how she could help me. And I told her I was looking for a church that I could go to, prefer the Methodist. And she goes, she asked me where I lived and I lived down this side of town. She goes, well, there's one called St. Luke's. And I'm going like, Okay, so it was, what, 20 minutes to get from there to here, and I got here, and uh, Shannon opened the door, and Shalom opened the door, and I knew automatically when I walked in the door, this was my place. It's God led me to this place, mm -hmm. and it's been wonderful. I, and I got to meet you from the same part of the country, you know, the same mm -hmm. county, Crosby County, and several other people, and so many people that know my sisters. Wow. Mm -hmm. like, this was for me. Hmm. And I love being here, and I want to get involved. I got to be in a in a in a play, Christmas play. Yeah, and and I even got to uh, teach in Bob school, Bob yeah. class. Hmm. So it's really good. I'm mean, I, I can't just wait to see when this COVID leaves and it opens yeah. back up and the the opportunities that come up. Well, that's I, all I know is the good and awesome work. That God started in you a long time ago, even before you knew he was doing anything in your life. That good and awesome work he started a long time ago. He's going to bring that work to completion today, Amen. Amen. tomorrow, and forever. Amen. Uh, Jesus, uh, right now, uh, we just pray, Holy Spirit, that you are moving and working in, in the folks that are hearing this message. Thank you, Lord. Uh, that Jesus, uh, they may be trying to fight some battle on their own, and they need to lay it down. They need to surrender. They need to fall on their knees and just say, Lord, I'm at the end of my rope. I need your help. Uh, Lord, there are other folks listening who uh, uh, maybe they've forgotten just how powerful huh. you are and your love is and can be in our lives. Lord, remind them of who you are and what you want to do and, and who you want to become in them and through them for others. I thank you for Leo because, God, there's nothing in him 
that wants to keep this message of grace to himself. Uh, Lord, uh, you are the light of the world, uh, but so, so too uh, is your servant, your son. Uh, he is light to us. And Lord, just start a fire, <laughs> a burning in Leo and through Leo for this world in which we live. God, but, but not just for Leo, not just for me. God, for every single person here this morning, and God, you bring a movement of your Holy Spirit that propels us uh, out from where we are, God, into this world to sow uh, just your truth, your love, your grace, your seeds of hope for a world that so desperately needs you. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I love you, bud. I appreciate it. I know. Thank you. It's a, uh, we did it on Zoom here so everybody else could see it, but uh, uh, I, I love you, man. I love you too. Thank you. All right. Okay. See y'all later.